Good afternoon and welcome to the Simple Solutions Towards Better Neuroinclusivity virtual event. Please welcome INSA President Suzanne Wilson Heckenberg. Thank you, Allie, for that introduction. I just had a great time in our green room talking to our moderator and panelists, and so I'm particularly looking forward to this afternoon's conversation. And I want to give a shout out to the group who made this possible, um, the NAPSEC Neurodiversity Network, which was established about two years ago in partnership with Dyslexic Edge, Enabled Intelligence, MITRE, and Social Grace, in order to help the IC focus on advancing meaningful career opportunities for neurodiverse individuals within the intelligence and national security community. Kudos to my partners for what we've been able to accomplish thus far. We have a LinkedIn group if you all would like to join us at the National Security Neurodiverse Network. This program today is designed to provide simple yet impactful practices that any organization, no matter how small or large, can implement to improve their approach to neuroinclusivity. Before we get started, though, I wanted to provide a few housekeeping notes. Today's program is on the record, open to the press, and is being and will be available on the INSA website later this week for viewing. If you have questions, and I know you will, please submit them through the questions box on the right side of your screen. You're welcome to include your name and organization for context, but it's certainly not required. And I also would like to take a moment and recognize my friend, Teresa Thomas, who is today's moderator. Teresa is the MITRE Corporation's program lead for neurodiverse talent enablement. And she has a long, long history of advocacy for the neurodiverse population. She has been a house parent in a group home for adults with high support needs, is a parent of an adult on the autism spectrum, and is very active in MITRE Corporation's inclusive and diversity programs. Teresa brought together an advisory council consisting of private organizations, universities, and self-advocates, and federal agencies to develop and pilot the Neurodiverse Federal Workforce Program. She has also designed and now spearheads MITRE's internal neurodiversity internship program. Teresa, I am gonna turn the stage over to you now. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, I need to make sure I send you a shorter bio for the next time, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm gonna do a couple of things really quick. First, I promised that I would uh, do some level setting on language. Um, just to, to get all the terms out there. So we're gonna throw out the prefix neuro attached to a lot of stuff today. Um, neurodiversity will be the big overarching theme, which is the diversity in our neurons. Our brains are all different. Everybody thinks differently. Everybody's brain functions a little differently. Introverts, extroverts, linear thinkers, creative thinkers, things like that. Uh, neurodivergent or neurodistinct now is the preferred term are folks who fall outside the normal differences where the the differences in the way their brains work can cause problems. So that's where we're talking about dyslexia, ADHD, um, autism, things, but, but when those things become a barrier for them is where it tips over into neurodistinction, neurodistinctness. Uh, and when we say neuroinclusion, we're talking about including everybody all along all those different spectrums in ways that help them really succeed at work. Uh, I also like to throw out the term neurospicy. It's my favorite. I like to bring it up every chance I get just because it sort of covers all of that easily. So that's sort of our level set where we are today. A lot of what we're going to talk about today will be about autism specifically because that's sort of the niche for a lot of us. But uh, I'm also gonna throw out some ideas for dyslexia. We have some uh, folks on our advisory panel who are really focused on that. And we'll bring in some stuff around ADHD because often those things overlap. So that's our level set. I would like now to introduce you to our panel, to have our panel introduce themselves to you. So we're gonna bring them up. I'm gonna ask you all to, um, name, rank, and serial number. So we name your organization and your role at that organization. I'll start, because this is the part I always forget. I'm Teresa. Suzanne just read my whole life story to you, so you know who I am and where I work. Um, white female, long hair, 
in a blue shirt with a sort of a back, back dark white background with a black chair. And if you see lights in my hair, that is my headset. I'm going to go next to Dr. Anabi going around my screen. Thank you, Teresa. Um, my name is Hala Anabi. I am. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a Middle Eastern woman with long um, brown hair and wearing a black blouse. And I have a white wall background because I moved to a new place. There's no art or plants plants around. Um, I am an associate professor at the University of Washington uh, in Seattle. And I focus uh, both in my research and teaching on inclusion in organizations for uh, innovation and learning. Uh, and over the last seven to eight years, I focus specifically on um, the inclusion of neurodivergent uh, people in the working workplace. Um, I work with organizations like Microsoft and SAP on identifying uh, organizational practices and managerial practices that lower the barriers and support uh, neurodivergent people to thrive in the workplace. Uh, and so that's why I'm here. And I'm um, really glad to be part of this panel and look forward to this conversation. And I'll popcorn it to uh, Major Dan. Hey, um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Dan Kaiser. Uh, I am an intelligence officer and a, an Air Force major. Um, as you can see, I'm in a cubicle farm, uh, <laughs> newly decorated just for you all. Um, but I lead the... Uh, Department of the Air Force uh, Barrier Analysis Working Group, Disability Action Team, Neurodiversity Line of Effort. Um, and before I get into a whole lot, I, I wanted to go ahead and read the quick disclaimer. Uh, the views expressed by me today are my own and don't necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Air Force, the Department of the Defense, or the US government. Um, Pertaining to me specifically, um, neurodiversity is a passion for me since I got diagnosed a couple of years ago and trying to figure out how that changes my career, uh, my future, and then ultimately my service. Um, and then the service of those around me who may be dealing with some of the same things. Uh, so that's, that's me, that's why I'm here. Uh, and I will hand it over to Lauren. Thanks, Dan. I am Lauren Bacon-Smith. I am the uh, Chief People Officer here at Enabled Intelligence. My pronouns are she, her, white female with long brown hair, wearing a orange top and a white background with some plants behind me. Um, Enabled Intelligence is a still, we still call ourselves a startup. We're about three years old. We work within the federal contracting space within AI and data labeling. And we are a little bit unique because we have a focus around hiring people with disabilities. About half of our team are people that identify with a disability, mostly people that are neurodiverse. Um, personally, I grew up with learning disabilities and understand um, deeply the different stigmas and challenges of learning and communicating differently. And um, you know, it's something that I feel very passionate about and, and very fortunate to get to work in this space and help um, a very uh, sometimes overlooked but extremely intelligent and talented community uh, really get to put, um, put them, their, their talents and, and skills to work um, here and now getting to be a part of this group of the, the NATSEC neurodiversity network and, and helping to uh, spread the word and, and get other other companies and organizations on board. So um, here at Enabled Intelligence, I, I run HR and really all things culture and inclusion. So I'm excited to share a little bit about what we've done the last few years. Awesome. Thank you so much. So clearly we've brought together an illustrious panel and uh, I think you guys are going to learn a lot. I think I'm going to learn a lot today. I'm really excited about that. I wanted to just let you know that the sort of the the core of what we're trying to get at today is the fact that being neuroinclusive is not is not rocket science right um, I know this we do rocket science at MITRE this is not it um, it's it can it's not sunshine and roses don't get me wrong but some things that you that you really should be doing are really simple most of them are free 
some very, very inexpensive. And I, I know that a lot of folks are afraid to step out, afraid that they'll do something wrong, afraid that it's a million dollar program that they need to run. And we just wanted to help everybody understand that there are some really simple things you can do to really make your workplace better for the folks you've already got and for the folks that might be coming in sometime. And speaking of the folks you already got, I want us to start with uh, Dr. Nabi letting us really fully understand why this matters. There are some really compelling numbers out there. And I think that helps you understand the difference you make in being neuroinclusive is bigger than just the two people who might have self-identified. So, Dr. Nabi, can you throw yes. us some numbers? Yes. So, um, what we are referring to is the representation in the workforce around neurodivergent people. So, data suggests, and data is incomplete. Uh, diagnosis is getting better. So, there are folks in the workplace that are not diagnosed. Uh, some know and identify as neurodivergent. Some do not. Um, but data suggests, the research suggests that somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of the population is neurodivergent. Um, so it includes one um, neuro variation or neurotype, um, whether it's autism, ADHD, dyslexia. Uh, and so that's a significant percentage of the workplace that you already have that in order for organizations to empower these employees to contribute to ways that can add to innovation. One of the things that we know and research suggests is cognitive diversity, uh, neurodiversity can add to uh, creative problem solving, innovation, uh, different ways of doing things, also representation of your constituents or your marketplace. Uh, so when you have that representation, but not just representation in terms of numbers, right? It's really their inclusion where people can come and contribute in ways that are conducive to them so that we can uncover and uh, provide space for uh, different ways of thinking and being can add to that inclusion. It's not just having representation without inclusion. So I wanna add that. And the other thing I, I want to emphasize in terms of um, cost that Teresa mentioned, um, just earlier in May, on May 4th, the, the Department of Labor produced a report that suggests that 50% uh, of accommodations that are requested generally are at, at no cost. And all other accommodations that do incur a first-time cost, their median cost is $300. So from a cost investment, the numbers are low, and the Department of Labor's report that came out last month uh, suggests that. But also, one of the things that is really important to think about when we talk about neuroinclusion and investments, um, accommodations and success enablers, not just accommodations, simple things that don't require um, paperwork and such, can reduce turnover, can reduce training time, uh, can reduce attrition and absenteeism. So all of these really add to if you create neuroinclusive spaces, you are going to leverage your employees to their best of their ability and retain them and reduce your costs. Um, so that's really important. The other thing I want to highlight, research suggests, we all know, many of the practices we're talking about, they are neuroinclusive, but they're also beneficial to all employees, neurodivergent and neurotypical. Uh, one of the things we hear over and over these are basic leadership practices and managerial practices that we forget about. So everything we're going to talk about is not just you know, neurodivergent specific, although some are really important for certain neurotypes. They are helpful for everybody, and we'll highlight that in a little bit. But I wanted to throw some of that research framing mm -hmm. around a, a really good portion of your employees are neurodivergent, whether they know it or you know it or not. So let's accommodate. Two, costs are low. Three, the return on investment is so high in terms of innovation, retention, and everything else. And it applies to everybody. And I love that you brought that up because it's so true. And I, I want to sort of frame everything around this. Um, we're not here to tell you you're doing things wrong. We're just here to bring up things that you, you might have forgotten about or haven't thought about lately. And I, my favorite quote to throw out there and all these things is from... Um, 
Nikola Bilokonsky, and I, if I ever meet this person, I hope they teach me how to actually say their name without butchering it. But um, things that are obvious to me are different than the things that are obvious to you. And so the things that that I get flagged, you know, as soon as I walk in the room, I see those things. It's not because you were dumb that you didn't see those things. It's because they're not obvious to you. They're obvious to me, right? So I want us to frame a lot of that. The things that we're bringing up today, uh, it's not that you're dumb that you didn't think of them. And, and most of them will seem like no brainers to you, I feel like once we start saying them, but that um, they just become more obvious to some of us than others. So let's get into the heart of this discussion. I'm gonna throw these out to everybody, but I'll, I'll call on you each to get going. So if we remember, time also has a cost. So when we say no cost, we're talking about hard cost, but there is time involved in a lot of these as well. So, so know that we know that. Um, are there low cost or no cost changes that you've seen in the workplace that have made a, a big impact? What are, your, what are your favorite two or three? We're trying to keep our, our time here. So I'm gonna start with Lauren. Sure, so um, kind of on the theme that Dr. Anabi just talked about, what when we, we had and still have the advantage of being a new company, so and we had this mission to begin with. So we were building our company around the strategic focus of, of inclusion. And that's really, even though we do have a focus on hiring within the disability community and the neuro, neurodiverse community, really the way that we really think about it is inclusion overall. And um, we were really strategic about uh, the things we were looking at. We looked at what, why are we doing this? Why, why, you know, we're not just doing it because it's the right thing to do, it's a nice thing to do, we're not a nonprofit. Um, this was part of our business strategy and the type of talent that we needed. Um, and the outcomes that our clients needed. We needed very attention to detail, focus, pattern recognition, structure, um, you know, people that were going to be uh, technology focused and, and easily trained in these spaces. So we identified <laughs> this as a target for us. And so when we were looking at building the company and all of our policies, we looked at what's actually needed versus what are the industry norms or the professional norms and standards that you know every place that you've probably ever worked have in place. Uh, and we looked at setting all of that aside and, and really stripping it down to what is needed for our team members to be successful here and our clients to get the absolute best product at the end. So we looked at our job descriptions and we took away all the requirements and things in job descriptions that are, you know, in everything, you know, strong verbal and written communication skills. We don't care about that. Um, we took away de degree requirements, you know, and of course these things are not going to be a one size fits all for every position, but these are just examples of things that we did where we looked at things that are in almost every job description out there even every entry level job. And we stripped down to what's actually needed. Uh, we looked at our interview process and criteria. We are not looking at, you know, how somebody is um, presenting themselves and, you know, and they're having a, uh, you know, making eye contact or having a certain type of charismatic personality or cultural fit. Um, we really wanted to create a space where people could be their full and true selves and not waste energy on trying to fit into a mm. norm that a company or society has set and instead can use their energy to be productive and, and do the best work that they're capable of doing. So that means that, you know, our team members might dress and look and sound and communicate and learn differently. And, we don't only say that's okay, we truly live and breathe it. And it's not, we take away a lot of these things that people spend a lot of energy on. And this is not just neurodiverse individuals, this is really all of us, if you think about it. Um, and create a space where people can come and feel comfortable being themselves and being mm. productive. So um, that, what I'm, I'm hearing your number one thing that you guys have done that has been the most effective is, is see people as individuals and let them be who they are at work. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And you know, we try to just create as much flexibility and space for that as possible in terms yeah. of how how 
communicate with people, how we do training. Um, you know, we always are trying to offer, you know, multiple forms of mm -hmm. communication and training, whether that's written, verbal, videos. Um, and yeah, like you said, Teresa, just looking at each person as an individual versus just a number and trying to make uh, them fit into a box. That's great too, because um, it goes back to the, everyone on the spectrum is completely different from one another. Everyone with dyslexia is completely different from one another. And to try and put something blanket in place is gonna cause you issues. But asking the people who are there what they need is where it's gonna be very helpful. Um, Major Kaiser, uh, how about you? Give, give um, one or two. So I love the uh, just the notion of uh, individualized consideration as a leadership mechanism, uh, getting to know people uh, and understand that flow state for everybody looks different. Um, and from the uh, the neurodiversity perspective, um, a lot of that means understanding the ways that our brains uh, process stimuli. Uh, so I really want to focus on lights, sound, and smell. Uh, three senses that I struggle wrangling on a daily basis um, in a really a concept that I, I'm borrowing from uh, Teresa, the, uh, the idea of sensory gating. I try to do sense make, I try to conduct that sense making of every single external stimulant all the time. Uh, so really uh, my favorite two or three uh, low, no cost changes are modifying the way my brain processes lights, sound, and smell. Um, tinted glasses. My glasses have just a little bit of a tint, um, and I'm also very thankful that you can't really tell right now, but these lights are inverted so that you can't see uh, the harshness mm -hmm. of, of any sort of fluorescence, uh, which is really, really pleasant. My last organization did not have that. Um, sounds, noise-canceling muffs, um, loop earphones, uh, even something as simple as a sign that says, uh, let's, let's try to keep it a little quiet in here. Um, and then as far as smells, sometimes that's, that's really where that self-advocacy comes in and says, hey, um, that smell isn't great for me uh, and I'm sure having trouble focusing. Uh, we could also use things like air fresheners, um, things that maybe mute some of the, uh, the smells around us. Uh, and I've, I've really found a lot of those to be uh, good sensory dampening tools um, in addition to to the practice of uh, individualized consideration uh, that Lauren uh, noted. That's cool. I like that you're bringing in that that um, you're self-advocating for those things yourself because those things are really obvious to you. Back to our original thought, right? This, that yeah. smell might not be obviously offensive to me but to you it is. And so, you know, we have to have that understanding about each other. I know that when I interview um, students or employees at MITRE who are on the spectrum and um, when, we, when we do panels, one of my favorite questions is what is the one accommodation that you have found the most useful? And um, with, without exception, uh, I think, yeah, every single one of them always says uh, written notes after meetings and written instructions. Write it down, write it down, write it down. And that's gonna be the opposite. If somebody is dyslexic, right, they're gonna need both. They're gonna need it audio and visual. But a lot of folks on the spectrum struggle with auditory processing and, and or their ADHD. Like you can tell me something when I'm standing next to you and by the time I get to my desk, I've written three dissertations in my head and <laughs> that's so gone. So, um, just shooting a note after you've given somebody instructions when they walk by you or shooting out, making sure every, every meeting ends with the minutes being sent out to everybody. Everybody will appreciate it because half of them will have wandered mentally somewhere along the line, <laughs> especially if you're giving instructions. So the, that's my big one, write it down, write it down, write it down. It takes time, but it will save you so much time in the end. Um, Dr. Anabi. Yeah. So these are all great ideas. And yeah. I'll, you've written a few gonna, books on this. <laughs> I just want to throw that out there. Just a couple. Um, one way to, to think about it is creating clear set of expectations mm. um, around how we operate. So one of the things I do personally in my teams, and I suggest for every team, whenever a new member comes in, or every couple of years if your membership is stale, is what I call a team alignment exercise. And the team alignment exercise has a multiple dimensions. One is 
what are your preferred modes of communication? Uh, so for example, my team and I have a set of tools that we use, but within those tools, we have certain signals. For example, when on my office is a no, no disturb sign or my Teams has a no disturb sign, there's no messages or interruption that come in and the team will signal or send the message later on for that deep work. So we use the calendar and our technology tools to say, this is when I'm doing my deep work. Please don't come to my office. Please don't try to call me or send me a message. Because even if I don't have my notifications on, um, when, uh, when I sent a message to my coordinator, even if it's saying later, not important, because I'm the manager, I'm the lead, they're gonna prioritize it. So part of it is really reducing that. So being very clear about here are the three tools and the three signs that we have around interruption and around mode of communication is important. Um, the other thing I want to mention, Teresa talked about sending notes and written explicit directions of who's doing what is really important to send for alignment purposes and to double check understanding. So when you write it, it's another form for you to verify that your team understands and you're all on the same page of what needs to be done and who's doing it. And there's a cost benefit actually to that. It might take you five minutes uh, for you or for someone in the team to write the notes, but it saves you days and hours of fixing mm -hmm. errors and misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. So, and these are ba basic managerial uh, strategies. They're especially important for uh, a person who has uh, challenges managing multiple messages or oral versus written versus visual, but they're also about, again, creating shared meaning uh, through explicit communication. Um, we write our communication preferences. So again, in terms of creating expectations, what is the best way to communicate with you and when is really critical. Um, so doing an exercise that shares that not only creates um, understanding of, oh, I shouldn't interrupt Teresa now because she has the no disturb sign or I know she's working on this project. It creates a different understanding of, hey, I know that this is a good practice. Also, maybe I should try it and see if it works for me. And all of a sudden, we start sharing best practices. And as a team, we become more productive. Um, so sharing expectations around communication preferences and communication styles. I want to highlight communication styles a little bit. Uh, neurotypes appreciate and understand and present information in different ways. So. I tend to be direct and blunt in my conversation. That's ethnically, culturally, kind of the way I communicate. I spend a lot of time in New York, very direct. Um, for the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, the directness might come as a little curt, right? So when I explain, I'm directing my communication to my team and here are the ways I communicate, it's received differently then perceived differently than, oh, she's really not nice and she's not personable and she's just so aggressive in her communication because there's loaded other identities and biases that come in. So explaining communication preferences, explicit ways of what we need to do and how we might do it productively is really important. Um, one way to get at that as a manager is the neurodiversity hub has an assessment tool of 70 some questions, but they also have them summarized into 12 questions, can help you generate a discussion in your team around these preferences and make them visible rather than invisible, right? Um, and I, the other thing I will say, those tools are important because sometimes asking a new um, junior employee, how do you work best and what do you need me to support you? They might not know what's possible. They don't know, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, um, the neurodiversity hub assessment tool around work preferences gives you a really good way to suggest different things. Ask Jan is also another place where you can get those. Um, so, um, so that's askjan.org. Askjan.org. Yeah. Neurodiversity hub is a dot com or a dot org. I think it's dot, dot org. Com. Dot org. Neurodiversity hub dot org. Amazing I, resource pool, by the way. Everything you could yeah. think of is buried in there somewhere. And I would look up the biodex. Yeah. 
ultranauts has started publishing things about how their biodex works. Yeah. It's a great idea too. And then those playbooks, you mentioned the playbooks. Yeah. Uh, Disability in dot org. org website has several now uh, neurodiversity at work playbooks that are very, very helpful. All right. So um, those are some of our, well, we've thrown out the resources. Um, we'll come back to more resources here in just a minute. I think there's some great stuff out there that can help you feel a little less overwhelmed. We got some questions ahead of time and I wanted to, uh, I think most, many of them we have hit, right? But one theme that came up in a lot of these questions was about privacy, about HIPAA, about PII, about how do you balance people's privacy with providing them with what they need. And I know I hit that a lot at MITRE with students um, where the manager says, look, somebody came to me and asked what's up with this kid. And if I could just tell them what's going on, then everything would be answered and I wouldn't have to dance around the whole topic. But, but you do, it's not your job to disclose for somebody. So um, let's talk a little bit about that balance of privacy and accommodation and uh, respecting people's own right to disclose how and when they would like, but still get them what they need. And I'm going to start with Dan because I started with Lauren last time. Um, can you uh, rephrase the question just? Yes, time? I can. Uh, see, back to that thing where I'm from the South and I fluff everything. Um, how do you balance privacy and getting people the help they need, right? So I know you need something. How do I get give that to you without disclosing to everybody that you're on the spectrum? Definitely. Uh, so that that's the challenge everywhere, right? Um, how do you balance the HIPAA requirements? And as a uniform member, I have less uh, ability to, to, I guess, protect some of that information. Um, th that's really where it boils down to um, inclusive leadership again. Um, and individualized consideration and understanding everybody is different. Um, everybody has uh, a different look to their to their flow state. So getting to know your people as a leader, as a manager, as a director, as a support team member, uh, understand what the people around you need in order to be most successful, and then go into every conversation uh, presuming positive intent. And then uh, I always like to throw out there an adaptation of Hanlon's razor, uh, don't attribute to malice, which can be explained by a lack of understanding. Um, just because somebody isn't doing things the way that you're used to, doesn't mean they're doing things wrong. They may be doing things right because it works for them. It just doesn't look like the way that you're used to. So demonstrate a little bit of vulnerability. Um, I've created an environment where you your people trust you enough uh, to share what their flow state looks like, and then use the resources that you have available to you to help them realize that flow state as best you can. Again, going back to the uniformed versus uh, civilian side of the house, we have a requirement to be worldwide deployable. So we can't always uh, bend a whole lot on our requirements. That's really where it comes down to the individual uh, self-advocating for what they need uh, their tolerance for things and how they can um, adapt to an environment. That's wearing earplugs. Uh, those invisible uh, loop engage earplugs are huge for me because people can't always tell that I'm wearing earplugs um, and they don't ask those questions. Uh, tinted glasses that are prescription that I can wear in uniform are another thing. Um, People understanding that I have an extreme UV light sensitivity and I will probably be wearing sunglasses if I'm outside during um, the hours of daylight uh, and having really my leadership understand that that's not me being insubordinate. That is me doing what I need to do in order to mm -hmm. see three feet in front of me. Um, so to summarize the, the major things that I just said, uh, individualized consideration, self-advocacy, and uh, leveraging resources that you have at your disposal to optimize the flow state for the people within your organization. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would throw out there, um, address 
address the limitation, not the diagnosis? Yes. And say, you know, if somebody comes to me and was like, why is he wearing a headset? You know, I could say, well, he he struggles with sensory gating I, if I want to get fancy. Or I could say, you know, he needs quiet mm -hmm. to be able to work and focus. And so that's what he, or for me, you know, why do I have to tell, why why do you have to have written notes? Well, you know, I, I sometimes struggle with keeping things in order. And so I need those notes. And that does not have a diagnosis, mm -hmm. but it does address my limitations. Um, Hala? Yes, I, I love this discussion. And one way I, I would say addressing privacy is if we reframe a diagnosis or a need because a person is neurodivergent, because there are folks that don't have a formal diagnosis. Um, and we know diagnosis is really complex. So one of the things I like to do is kind of reframe. Um, why are we perceiving Dan wearing sunglasses outside as a problem? if it makes them more effective at doing their work. Um, so one way to also uh, address that is, can we challenge why the thinking around this particular behavior is a deficit view versus a strength view? For example, Teresa, with the context of written notes, well, written notes is because it gets all of us to agree that we're on the same page. It's not just about me, it's actually about you and I coming to an agreement and so that we don't forget it and we cement it. So it kind of reframes from this is a, a disability to actually this enables work to be an enabler. Effective. Yeah, I love right? that language into that. You know, it's not that he can't focus without his headphones. It's that he is a rock star focused exactly. monster with his headphones on. Exactly. Yeah. So kind of reframing when someone comes to me and says, this student does this. Well, why is that a problem? Or focus on their strengths and what they can do and focus on what you can do to change the way you think so you can get to the outcome. If we continue to focus on getting to the shared goal and outcome, I think that changes the framing around some of those preferences and needs. Um, and it's challenging because we've grown to accept certain things and think of certain things as professional expected in the workplace. But that sometimes gets in the way of us getting to our ultimate shared goal. Um, so I love thinking about, instead of privacy and sharing, reframe it to say, what's the best practice to enable the success of every member to contribute in ways that are most conducive to them? There are some things that won't answer, right? Um, why is he pacing in the hall? So like I had a violent pacer who's <laughs> just like, yeah. it was a very intense pacer. Um, and you know, that's back to that, that's how he focuses. You know, we turn it, mm -hmm. that turns it yeah. a little bit without, without yes. quite being the whole team thing. Lauren? Yeah, you know, I think it's within the same theme. Um, you know, we've never used the uh, formal reasonable accommodation process before. We don't really even talk about accommodations much here. and 50% of our workforce are people with disabilities. And the reason is because they don't have to go through a formal process or ask mm. to do things differently. It's just okay if they do things differently. And we automatically try to take differences into consideration. And of course, each person is different. And this goes for our neurotypical and, and able-bodied people as well. You know, we I learn differently and like to communicate differently than Peter, our CEO, you know, like if you create a safe space and a culture where that is okay, A, you're going to have people that will be able to do things differently to get their jobs done. And then B, you're not going to have other people saying, well, why is she doing it that way? Or why does he get this? And I don't get that. Yeah. Because if they need it, they want it, they can also have that regardless of a medical diagnosis or a disability or, mm -hmm. you know, your your neurodivergent status. Um, and, you know, that that's, that's just a bigger cultural shift that businesses and organizations need to think about how they're doing things and how they can get the most out of their people and create an environment where people can feel safe and healthy and happy and that's a place where they're going to stay um, and especially within the neurodivergent community a lot of times it's not the issue of them you know getting jobs but keeping jobs and a lot of times it's not that they're being terminated they're leaving because they don't feel valued there they don't feel understood they don't feel that they're able to work to their full potential and a lot of times they're probably not even asking 
for help that they might need because they don't feel that that's an option or that it's going to be received well or they're going to be I, we've had team members you know we always ask at the beginning even during an interview if there's any accommodations that someone might need and we've had somebody tell us well i don't like to take accommodations i try not to because i don't want to be different and but everyone's different here so it, it's more about mirroring and seeing people seeing that it's okay um, and you're not going to be treated or looked at differently because you're doing things differently um, and you know that's again just inclusion yeah. overall not just to this community yeah and I'm listening to the things you're describing and thinking that those things are so exhausting it's so exhausting and I think that's why we lose people sometimes too they're just so exhausted from trying to pretend like they're not autistic all day long or for trying to pretend like they're not dyslexic all day long you know and not be noticed and that's where we go back to to Dr. Anabi's success enablers instead of accommodations just that one little thing just changing that phraseology um, sometimes sometimes not always but sometimes can make a big difference for folks um, we have some pretty pointed questions here coming in today about finding work um, now for the record that's a whole panel like that's a whole three-hour discussion <laughs> but um, some are pretty specific uh, to to the US government jobs as well but we have uh, from Thilla hi Thilla um, a recent college graduate, do you have recommendations on finding jobs that have autism supports? And then are there jobs in the U.S. government that, and their contractors that are advertised as neurodiverse? So yes, there's a couple things you can look for. Um, look for jobs that specifically mention it, neurodiversity, companies that specifically mention it, that's a good way to do it. You can go to that disability insight that we talked about earlier and look for their, the employer roundtable, all the employers that are listed there, plus MITRE, never managed to get ourselves on the webpage, um, are neuro-inclusive. Um, some have specific programs, some have just extra supports. And then if you're on the um, usjobs.gov, I would look for, um, schedule a available work i don't know dan dan, dan do you have any so I'm yeah um lately. i'm listening now i got you as i was thinking uh so schedule a disability uh does give you a hiring preference um but with that being said uh, there are some challenges that go along with it uh um right. schedule a i i believe is non-competitive um so you don't go through that same uh, hiring right uh, so that's um yeah i i i was well i wasn't saying you weren't listening i was saying you're not actually looking for work so you're not out there looking for this but um <laughs> uh schedule a open jobs might not be listed on the usa go uh, in us government right. whatever us jobs um because they're not competitive that's part of what's so good about them so i have seen on linkedin a couple of agencies posting that they're looking specifically to hire folks. Um, I think census, no, IRS was a while back. Um, I know CISA will be looking soon. So um, I don't have a great answer for that. I feel kind of terrible. I should know that, but I don't for that one. Other places Hopefully, to look though? After we get done with this webinar, more of our you know, government uh, agency right. friends, they'll be figuring out ways right. to if you're you, here uh, and you're hiring, drop your uh, drop your info up in the chat because we've got some folks here that are looking. Sorry, Lauren, I cut you off. Oh, yep. no, okay. no. Okay, great. Um, all right. Oh, we did get some links in the chat. Oh, good. So we've been asked for the links. There's a lot of links um, that we have just thrown at you, and it looks like Dr. Anami is on it. All right. Thank you so much. Okay, let's see. Uh, cultural change in organizations can be like turning the Titanic. Um, suggestions on how to start? <laughs> uh, again, Holly, you wrote a couple books on that. <laughs> so I think the first thing we always say is um, make it very clear why neural inclusion is important for your strategic initiative. So why is this a business imperative? Creating it, framing it in that way really creates the business case for it, which is really important. Align it with the values of your organization. So I always say, 
you begin with your strategy, your values. So and really making it a critical part of your diversity, equity, and inclusion and accessibility efforts. Unfortunately, one of the things we've seen, and again, neurodiversity employment is a newer phenomena and a newer push, but in most of our efforts around diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and sovereignty are focused on certain populations, marginalized or minoritized populations. And neurodiversity is just getting recognized and included. So to turn the tide, making sure that it's spelled out and articulated in very explicit ways within your strategy and values is really important. From there, within all of your action items around how do you achieve those you know, cognitive diversity orientations that will contribute to your work, then you can create the training around it, uh, making sure that you change some of your processes. For example, I'll, I'll give you a very quick example from the software industry. Um, agile methods and scrum techniques around uh, sharing information in a stand-up meeting really quick and rapid fire is not neuro-inclusive, but it's a huge strategy and shift that happened in the technology industry for application development. So how can you actually change that practice so that you can be neuro-inclusive and you can uh, create space for these really creative minds that need to share that information in different ways? If you have that as a strategy, we want innovation. You look at your software development processes and your project management processes to change them. Then you're very clear um, on how to not just say this is important to us, but also operationalize it in your practices and processes in meaningful ways. And then ask your employees what's working and what's not, right? Getting the feedback loop from your neurodivergent employees Follow their lead. They're critical members who know how things work. And sometimes they know very minor things we could do to make that work happen. Um, but I always say, start with your strategy and values. Make sure that it's incorporated into your DEI strategies, your talent acquisition strategies, and your processes. But the most critical part, I would say, supervisors and managers are the most critical resource that you have to implement inclusion, right? So training them, empowering them, giving them the time to do the work. I get managers that say, I'm supposed to do this, but I don't have any training. And I might have training on hiring, but I don't have training on advancement. So how do I do that? So empowering your managers becomes really critical. I'll stop there because I think I went on for a while. <laughs> That's great. I like that starting. I, I did that when I first started pitching a program at MITRE. I went through the company. Now, I'm not in charge. I can't change our strategies, and but I can go read which ones have already been written. And everything I say, I can use that language because then I'm hitting everybody's buttons. You know, all the little measures that all these VPs have to hit to meet their goals for the end of the year. I'm showing them how this will hit all those measures that I hit. It's a bunch of them. And so, um, you know, even if you are, and that was one of our questions we had earlier, you know, what if I'm not a manager? If I'm just out there, I'm not in HR, how can I make this difference? And that's part of it is, is I tell people the big, the, the reason I have any programming at all is because I just talk a lot, <laughs> um, averaging that ADHD, but, but using the language of your leadership so that they understand how this fits is, uh, it, it helps a lot. And then setting up, I hear a lot of people talk about setting up a neurodiversity ERG, an employee resource group. Um, I, I didn't for a long time because I thought I'm not autistic. I have no business starting this, but um, I did finally. And now it has autistic leadership because it is there and got stood up and it just gave a safe space. It helps the company see that they do have folks on the spectrum and they have a voice and they have some suggestions. So that's a good place to find those things that you mentioned earlier, Hala. And um, bringing in outside speakers was another one that I heard. Uh, bringing in some people that, you know, they always, it's like having kids. If you get somebody else to say it, they'll listen better than if you say it, right? Um, any other ideas for turning the Titanic? Yeah, and you're working so, in the military, but you're, this is like your life right now. <laughs> Speaking of the Titanic. So um, 
Yeah, um, we have education at all levels of, uh, of military service from your your basic training or your OTS to your uh, junior supervisor training, whether that in the Air Force is uh, Airman Leadership School uh, on the officer side, it could be a squadron officer school, intermediate leadership training, NCO Academy, uh, Air Command and Staff College, more senior leadership training with Air War College and senior NCO Academy. Those are all pretty mandatory touch points to reinforce elements that we want to instill in our culture. Uh, and part of that is inclusive leadership um, and understanding how to lead people in a transformational manner. Mm -hmm. And uh, after four years of teaching that squadron officer school uh, level, um, really the main thing that I've taken away, um, people, in the military learn how to lead um, in, in sort of a trial by fire. Uh, there is no handbook, uh, and I suspect the same in the, in the civilian world. Uh, there is no handbook, um, but we can use shared experiences, we can use case studies to really see how things have gone well and how things have gone poorly so that we can learn what to do better. It's a matter of ensuring that that narrative is woven throughout all levels of military education on my side and then supervisory education on, on within your organization. Yeah. Talk, talk, like I said, just a, it's a lot of it's about talking and just yep. changing the framing in your conversation. And I, I personally love my little internship program because it's my manager apprenticeship program. I'm training my managers. They don't know it, but shh, I'm training them how to be better managers. We are down to about three minutes. So I had one more question and I'm going to see, uh, we'll see how fast you guys can popcorn these. All right. What do you think folks listening could do today, maybe tomorrow, if they've got a lot on their plate today? to be more neuroinclusive. One thing, if they go back to their desk after they close down this meeting, one thing they could do. I'm gonna throw out, take notes at your next meeting and send them out afterwards. They don't have to be great, just notes. I got an easy one. Um, ask somebody that you don't know that well on your team what they need in order to be successful. Get to know your people. Lauren? Yeah, I was going to, you know, say, ask whether you're a manager or just a, a, you know, member of a team, ask everyone on your team how they like to communicate and, um, you know, what that looks like for them. Um, I think that that goes a long way. I like that. Make it a team thing. To mm -hmm. Hala's point earlier, it's about, about your whole team. Hala, one thing. Yeah, I would say um, the one thing you could do is, Take one assumption around how your team should behave or communicate and open it up question whether that assumption attaches or contributes to your objectives in meaningful ways. So question your assumptions about what it means to I, be. I want effective. an example. Give me an example. I need, I need more on that one. Yeah. So for example, um, question your assumption around the time, the hours that a person works, right? I know in some positions, eight to five is the most important thing, but if you're working on a creative project and you have a, an employee that works better at night, um, can you have flex hours so that they can contribute in ways that are conducive to them? Um, that's a just question assumption of, does it have to be eight to five? Does it have to be eight to five in the office Monday through Friday? Or can you have an understanding of when this person works best and that they do the work and they contribute, but in a flexible work arrangement? Nice. I have one. Uh, everybody has to sit down around the table for the meeting. Mm -hmm. Do they? Can they pace and listen? Can they stand up and listen? Can they turn around and face the other way and still be listening to you? Laura, Dan, you guys have one. What would be an assumption? Could, did anything pop into your head when she was saying that? Here's one. Yeah. Do I have to be on camera? Because I'm I'm fidgeting like a maniac off camera. Uh, that works better for me when the camera's off. Oh, yeah. Gosh. We finished a little um, early, so you have time to think. 
or about um, somebody's, you know, personality. I, I, my background is in recruiting before HR, and you always, oh, well, they're just not a fit. You know, they, they I didn't get that mm-hmm. feeling from them. It's mm-hmm. like, does it really matter if they're a, a bubbly, outgoing extrovert for them to do their job? Um, there you go. That's a we have some team members that barely speak and some that are that bubbly person and it does not matter for them to be successful. No, that's a great point. And um, my my last one is just uh, avoid mirror imaging. Uh, don't look in the mirror and say, this is the kind of person that I need across my organization. And um, it takes all kinds and you definitely need those different perspectives in order to have a thriving organization. It's going to be difficult and it's going to be so worth it. You said you had one, Suzanne? You have one? I have one. Um, Don't assume that because someone isn't necessarily making direct eye contact with you, that they are not paying, you know, they are paying attention. You don't know what they're absorbing, even though you're not looking them directly in the eyes. I forgot about that one. That's a big one. Wow. All right. I took notes. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. I know, uh, Hala, I know you, you, you stepped out of a conference to be here with us. I know, Dan, you're four days on a new post. Lauren, I know you have a lot of work to be doing. So thank you all so much for giving us your time today. This was great. And, and thank you, Teresa, um, for doing such a wonderful yeah. job um, facilitating today's conversation. Dr. Anavi, Major Kaiser, and Lauren, um, I just want to thank you all for contributing and providing some insights um, for the group. I'm really proud of this content that we have cumulatively been able to come together and provide our virtual attendees today. And I'm also really delighted that the program's being recorded. Um, it will be available on INSYS website by the end of the week. And I would encourage folks to pass it along, um, expand um, people's aperture for their understanding of really what neurodiversity means and, and the power um, to the workforce, as well as specifically the intelligence community. Um, quickly, when the webinar ends, um, there'll be a very very brief survey, um, please complete it. It really means a lot to the NATSEC Neurodiversity Network so we can take in your ideas and incorporate them into future programming. And don't forget to join our LinkedIn group. Thanks so much and have a wonderful afternoon.